I want to welcome everyone uh, to this presentation on Maine's, Western Maine's globally important bird area. Uh, I'm David Miller. I am the director of the Ranger Lakes Heritage Trust. We are a land trust that uh, right now is conserving about 14,000 acres. Um, and we're fortunate enough to spend our time caring about and caring for the uh, land, water uh, of this region. And uh, as I say, feel fortunate to spend full time doing that. Uh, today's presentation is with uh, <clears throat> Dr. Pete McKinley, Peter McKinley. Pete is a lead ecologist for the Wilderness Society. He has a PhD uh, from the University of New Brunswick, has worked extensively both in academics, in the field with conservation groups. Uh, I can't think of anybody better to uh, spend some time with us teaching us about the habitat and biodiversity in this region. Uh, more than anything, Pete is a very generous person who spends a lot of time up here in Rangeley and with other conservation groups, adding his expertise uh, to all of our communities. So I wanna thank Pete for being here. And before we get started, uh, just to note, this will presentation will go for about 30 minutes or so, and then we'll have time for questions and comments at the end. Uh, please use the chat room to note down any questions uh, during, during the presentation, and I will read them to Pete uh, after we finish uh, with his formal uh, presentation. So uh, again, welcome, thanks for joining us, and uh, Pete, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, David, appreciate it. Hi, everybody, thanks for showing up. I, um, I'll, I'll start by saying, um, when uh, I was approached by Rangeley Lakes Heritage Trust, or asked, approach sounds so formal, um, how this goes back, I think maybe even before the pandemic, um, uh, the, the thought was, hey, can you talk about the globally important bird area this way? Um, and sir, I'm not the, I'm not the, uh, the sole or the person to talk specifically at length about the, the Audubon uh, bird area. Um, we have other biologists in state, um, Sally Stockwell with Audubon and any number of people. Um, I, I'm going to speak about the bird area uh, known as the Audubon globally important bird area, but also um, the, the bigger landscape um, that, uh, that that represents and um, that globally important bird areas are, um, are one of many different uh, spatial priority models that show, um, that help, help guide our conservation efforts in the region. And so the subtitle is uh, Lakes and Streams to Summits, uh, Connecting the Acadian Forest. The Acadian Forest uh, is, uh, well, let's see here. We got, uh, we got spruce and fir trees, Mount Katahdin, that looks like the Matterhorn. I just, I like these old uh, kind of retro postcard uh, uh, sh uh, scenes. And if there's any information here relevant to the talk, it's about gradients. And there's a lobster, red, so it's cooked. And the chickadee up here in the mountains. And, um, and from sea to mountain, our beloved state is full of ecological gradients. And it's gradients that uh, physical and biological that drive the, the diversity in the mountains. Um, and for orientation's sake, Flagstaff Lake, um, Farmington, Rumford, Rangeley's up in here, um, Chamberlain Lake of the Allagash Waterway, Moosehead, and um, this little spot right here, I hope my arrow is showing, it's Pemaquid Point. I'm reporting to you live from at the, up, up at the top of that peninsula in Damariscotta where I live. And the Acadian forest ecoregion includes, um, I, I was looking at it in great detail, I think the, the official ecoregion, which you'll see in a moment, um, includes the very tip of Pemaquid Point. So the point here, point here, sorry, about the pun, is uh, ecological gradients at many scales, Gulf of Maine into the mountains, and, um, and then within the high peaks and Rangeley area, the, uh, the gradients from lake to mountaintop, uh, helping to drive the, the diversity of the, of the region. 
and this is uh, what I call the, the conservation context. I, um, I, I, was, I just gave a talk yesterday and um, it required looking at the history of, um, of, well, the last three decades, which is just a scratch in time in, uh, in bigger pictures, but looking at the history of, of my involvement and the involvement of many people who are here who have been working on conservation in Maine. Um, going back to 1990, and I decided to throw this in for the fun of it, um, the dangers of messing around with a talk at the last minute. And, and um, uh, But I, 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 among other things, I like the graphics. Um, and here's Mount Katahdin, Baxter State Park, um, under my arrow, if indeed my arrow is showing. This stippled area being roughly the northern forest. Um, this was a study commissioned in 1990 in response to a major land transaction in northern New Hampshire and outlined the resources at stake, um, social, biological, physical, um, economic, uh, ecological, from the Adirondacks, Adirondacks Park, across Vermont, New Hampshire's White Mountains, and, um, and across Maine. Here in 2019, a slide I've borrowed from Forest Society, um, here's the conservation picture. So the idea being, well, 1990, lands, large, large private landowners are changing hands. Um, what, what, uh, what, does, what, what kind of future do we want? And we made a lot of progress. This goldish mustardy color, our conservation easements, uh, tool, conservation tool I'm sure you're familiar with, conservation full fee ownership. Here's Baxter State Park, and here's the National Monument, uh, Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument, which was not there in 1990. And then a little thread called the Appalachian Trail. Uh, the Appalachian Trail corridor itself is protected, about 99% of it at the least is protected to about a thousand feet and owned um, by the, owned and managed by the Park Service and the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. Um, a lot of the work I do is, uh, and others, is looking at ways to uh, conserve through willing transactions, willing sellers and buyers um, a larger swath of the Appalachian Corridor. A lot of work done, a lot of good conservation work done, but a lot yet to be done. And so um, the conservation priority, I call it loosely a conservation priority model, um, a, a call to arms uh, that, uh, that, that is part of the, the title of this talk, the um, important bird areas uh, nationally um, are among many different uh, spatial models, spatial priority schemes designed to help us pick and choose, justify, and motivate uh, con more conservation in the area, and in some cases, improve conservation. There we go. So here's the uh, the namesake, and um, um, again, I don't, I I will not dive into detail on the methods, but. Um, I think the point that I think I, I find interesting is that um, that when you look at various model models of the northern forest and uh, picking out the, um, the this big contiguous tract of forest, there's a lot of similarity, a lot of overlap. You know, red is um, is showing across the country uh, important bird areas as determined by the National Audubon models um, at the national scale. Uh, green, there's a lot more green in Maine, but it's too small to show up at this scale. You can see some parcels down east. That's at the state scale, about uh, 67,000, uh, 67, um, thousand acres. Um, oh, I'm wrong on that. Anyway, um, uh, and the globally important uh, area is in red, of course. Um, these, this is, okay, sorry. Um, this is uh, by the entire country of course, 67 million uh, state important areas across all 50 states and territories and, um, and across the country, 330 million acres across all countries are globally important. Here in Maine, um, this, this acreage would represent, um, well, the state of Maine is about 20 million acres and the Northern Forest is about half of that, 10 million acres. So roughly 10 million acres, maybe eight or nine. Diving deeper into some of the other priority schemes, um, the human footprint model models the degree of human impact. Uh, most wild or least influenced is a, is a darker shade of green. And this is on a relative basis uh, within, the, within the Acadian forest. And 
um, red, so red here compared to red compared to Boston. If if we expanded this window and uh, looked at the ecological integrity or degree of uh, of uh, conversion from historic land use patterns, if if the window were extended to a bigger area of the United States, this area around here. Um, Dammer Scott is somewhere in here, and there's Penobscot Bay, and here is the Pemaquid Point right about there. There's Pemaquid Point right there for reference sake, and I focus on that because it's about where I sit right now as I speak. Um, if this were expanded to include the, the, the eastern seaboard, these red areas would be, relatively speaking, green compared to Boston or Norfolk, Virginia, or Washington, D.C. But within this spatial extent, uh, which is a, the Acadian forest ecoregion characterized by uh, transitional hardwood and, and northern spruce fir and um, aspen, beech, birch, um, includes the Canadian provinces, about 26 million acres in the United States from the Adirondacks through New York, about 80 million acres um, overall. And here we have a very uh, loose, um, not loose, but uh, generalized, coarse scaled, I'll say, um, depiction of potentially important connectivity areas. You hear a lot about ecological connectivity in terms of population viability, genetic diversity being maintained, and climate change, climate change adaptive movements. And these are predicted potential uh, areas of flow or ecological movement, animals, plants. Um, not necessarily within one individual's lifetime, uh, actually typically not, but more across multiple generations, uh, population level movements. And so when we talk about conservation, we talk about finding the big blocks, the diverse blocks, uh, and also connecting those blocks. And um, these is all, all to sh if, if the pattern's starting to get familiar, um, the, the important bird area that we depicted earlier is roughly in here, here it is uh, on this map. And I also, tongue in cheek, but it's, it's, it's more serious than not, if you were to look at, say, a cell satellite, uh, cell phone coverage uh, map um, at a very coarse scale, that, or a road map, or a satellite map of lights from space, um, at a very coarse scale, that's also telling a similar story. We have a big contiguous forest, perhaps the biggest east of the Rocky Mountains, or I shouldn't say perhaps is the biggest, um, least permanently converted, though certainly there are logging roads as anyone who's traveled the Northwoods knows. A couple of papers of here at Wilderness Society with my colleagues, we, I functioned at a national level, focusing um, up and down the Appalachian Trail corridor. Um, this is from a paper I published with uh, Greg and uh, Greg Applett and Travis Belote. Um, another paper we published nationally on uh, important corridors and, and conservation cores. And again, the, 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 the pattern is there, the big, big contiguous forest, contiguous meaning roughly continuous, um, contiguous more referring to areas that abut, large spatial areas abutting rather than align. And here again in this paper showing the ecological integrity or um, uh, similarity to pre development conditions. Um, we have big unincorporated townships in this north woods of Maine. So when we talk about, and I was asked to talk about important bird areas, I, I went to the, the, the bigger picture or the accompanying picture. Um, important bird areas, important areas for recreation, outdoor recreation, important areas for frogs, trees, uh, all manner of wildlife, and um, the important bird areas being uh, one one uh, measure of that importance. This is the High Peaks region of Maine. I participate in a coalition of, of uh, folks who are doing the land transactions and I try to provide some advice and help. Um, here we have the uh, Flagstaff Lake, Avery Peak, Crocker Mountain, the so-called High Peaks of Western Maine. Here's the region right here, um, Rangeley Lake and the town of Rangeley and, um, and a diverse Diverse assemblage of birds. Um, this it depends on the book you look at and when it was published, but um, roughly speaking, um, what do we have here? One, two, three, four, five, six, uh, 12, 14 
orders of birds, uh, the class AVs being birds and, and the taxonomic orders representing the next step down and the taxonomic or, or uh, uh, phylogenetic tree. And um, some of these might not be all that common. Um, passerines, certainly plenty of passerines, migratory passerines coming up from Central America, Northern South America and the Caribbean, year round residents, including woodpeckers um, and uh, waterfowl, Anseriformes and the loon, an iconic species of the north of, uh, of Rangeley Lake in particular. And, um, and this is also part of the diversity story and the conservation value story. Um, this is a big contiguous block of intact, relatively intact forest at the national scale. And it's also at an ecological transition from um, areas to the south, just outside of that ecoregional line I showed in a previous slide. Uh, going into the northern forests and northern transitional uh, boreal subboreal forests. So we have a an elevational gradient. There's town of Weld, town of Farmington. Town of Farmington is maybe 8,000 feet. Um, Saddleback Mountain and, and the Horn and Reddington up uh, over 3,000 to 4,000 feet. And, um, and by the time you get to Rangeley, you have dropped back down off of the High Peaks Range. There's the Appalachian Trail. But the town of Rangeley is about a thousand vertical feet higher than some of the towns to the south here, Phillips, Kingfield, Strong. This shaded green representing the topography, the topographic difference. And again, that, that topography, that the soils, the microclimate, um, all driving diversity, uh, the, the diversity in some of the conservation values. Um, and the, Part of the mechanisms behind these uh, the diversity and the, the, the difference in, in uh, the, the comparative difference we have, say over several hundred feet, um, are driven by what the birds uh, use for forests, forest types. This is a successional gradient following harvest. And this is over to the right is represent, representing a mature forest community. So certainly uh, forest succession is driving some of that diversity. But the patterns I'm talking more about are uh, more of the um, more of the physiographic topographic patterns of diversity. So mature softwood um, or so medium aged or young softwood on top of a mountain is going to uh, support a different bird suite, different suite of bird species and other animal species than the um, the hardwoods down in the, the lower valley. Um, I talked a little bit about forest contiguity and 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 concepts of forest patch size. Um, this is uh, the wood thrush, an interior sensitive species. Um, the idea being that if, if these two areas, left and right, um, right below the wood thrush, were of total equal area, the contiguous patch with, has more interior habitat and is, um, is going to be a much better bet for some songbirds and other animals and plants to thrive than an equivalent acreage that's fragmented. Another mechanism behind all this diversity, um, if different tree species such as spruce and fir versus beech, birch, maple uh, support different insect uh, diversities. And um, actually the birds have different foraging efficiencies um, suited more toward one leaf structure versus another. Here's the black-throated green warbler, a species that breeds in uh, northern temperate forests and, um, and winters in, in uh, Central America wood thrush and other neotropical migrants. So some of the mechanisms behind these habitat and landscape level patterns. But back to gradients, I'm not uh, suggesting we have puffin and terns um, and, and uh, nor proximity to Muscungus Bay, which is where this photo was taken, but just to drive home that point of the, the ecological gradient. Sometimes when learning a, a topic, it's easiest to think of it in familiar terms at that very very uh, pronounced ends of a spectrum. So the Bicknell's thrush, which occupies the subalpine zone of the high peaks of, uh, of Western Maine and throughout the Adirondacks in New York, um, in New Hampshire and Vermont, uh, occurring in the kind of habitat that uh, is depicted here on Mount Abraham uh, versus the, the, uh, the loon down at the lower end of the gradient within the high peaks, Rangeley Lake, Quasick, and uh, loon with its chick. And uh, as again, the puffin is not occurring in, uh, in, in, in the Rangeley area, but to drive home that point about the, the ecological gradient 
driving in part the biological diversity. And here is Mount Abraham and, and again Rangeley and um, up on top we've got Arctic Alpine diapensia, uh, decidedly not a bird but an indicator of that alpine zone, Bicknell's thrush, black pole warbler, pine martin and lynx mammals, blackback woodpecker occurring in the subalpine forest, hardwood, moose and black-throated blue warbler, uh, Atlantic salmon breeding in the Orbitan stream and the Param on the south side of the mountain range, Canada warbler also uh, loosely associated with uh, riparian habitats, um, riparian forested habitats, and of course the loon at low elevation. This is marks kind of the second half or second, uh, second part of what I wanted to talk about and that is a tour of uh, some of this diversity of birds that I've uh, that you've been hearing about. And this will represent a hike, say, from the bottom of Mount Abraham up to the top or up to the top of Sugarloaf or Saddleback along a ski trail or, or one of the hiking trails. And um, whenever I give a talk about birds and uh, bird biology, I, I like to stress the, the, to me, the fun of knowing their whole life story and population story. And so, rather than focusing just on identification and, and field marks, um, there are a lot of resources out there available to uh, learn a little bit more about uh, their calls and songs. So you can get apps on your phone. At one time it was CDs, which I depicted here from the past. And um, I uh, include this, it's more for nostalgia's sake. The, uh, the Life of Birds was a, a um, this is, this is how a bird biologist spends his time at age 10 in the late 70s um, doing a correspondence course with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology uh, through the mail, as of course there was no web, um, learning about birds. And that's where I first learned why the robin sings and, and they all sing, um, at least uh, um, one of the reasons, um, including uh, the, the foraging and courtship and marking territory. Um, I think it's also a pretty beautiful song too, and appreciated at that at that value alone. Range, annual cycle, time and place, that's part of the bird's story and uh, certainly is going to help you identify it. Um, if, if, uh, if you think you're looking at a black-throated blue warbler and it's January and you're halfway up Saddleback, um, it's kind of circular reasoning to say it, it isn't because it can't be, um, but it probably isn't because uh, the black-throated blue warbler probably has long since departed for its wintering grounds in Central America by, uh, by January, or if it hasn't departed, it's probably perished. The common loon, and this is, uh, this is to show that the common loon, though a migrant, is, um, is uh, not going to Central America, as some of the warblers I'll show you do, but the common loon down at the bottom of this gradient in this vast contiguous important bird area and, and, um, and tract of land a number of us have from various organizations have modeled and identified. Um, breeding uh, uh, throughout Maine, we got Maine, Maine right here, little northern New Hampshire and Vermont, uh, northern Adirondacks, uh, across Canada and into Alaska. And wintering, I've seen them wintering in the Florida Keys and, um, and certainly I, my, the first loons that I ever learned or saw were in their wintering plumage growing up on Cape Cod. So um, this, this bird is to mark the, uh, the, the bottom of the avian gradient within Rangeley, um, not to be confused with the puffin and turn marking the, uh, the main, the bottom of the main gradient or uh, lower elevational end, in this case, sea level for those, guys, for those birds. Another aquatic bird, the common merganser, I remember seeing one um, up near Byron and a stream going downstream, going down a whitewater river, fa uh, female and probably, oh, it was 10, 11 ducklings. Um, they don't usually finish the, uh, the season with 10 or 11 ducklings, but that was early on and they were shooting rapids. Um, here they are breeding, um, breeding and year round in Maine. Um, see them uh, on the coast, the big groups of them gather in the Kennebec um, near Hollowell area. That, uh, I, I, well, used to observe when I commuted to Hollowell every day, 
um, winter range uh, across the United States, coastal states and interior and um, strictly breeding. So they're breeding, year round range is breeding and wintering, blue is strictly breeding. So another bird down at the lower end of that gradient, uh, moving slightly in and up from the gradient into freshwater wetlands, the American bittern, um, it's occurring in the summer in Maine and New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts. Um, some of the other talks I, I give and, and the ones in the field, I'll try to include an auditory component, but I uh, chose not to do that today. It um, doesn't always come through and I already had enough material as it, as it was, but I encourage you to go, you know, if you haven't, uh, go check out some of those resources. Um, the, uh, the apps are available that'll give you the, the, uh, the territorial and mating call of this, this, this bird. And I, sometimes when I'm feeling adventurous, I'll try to imitate it, but my voice is feeling a little scratchy, so I won't today. A little further up the gradient and certainly cosmopolitan, um, the downy and the hairy woodpecker, um, they may be occurring right down there at your feeders all winter long in Rangeley, um, but further up the mountain as well. And a couple of warblers I've already mentioned. Here's the, the black-throated green warbler. Um, you see this tongue of, of breeding range occurring down along the Appalachians. It's picking up the habitat it needs at higher elevations down the southern Appalachians and up here breeding from the Western Canadian provinces into the Eastern Canadian provinces and, and uh, all over Maine um, is uh, another, another welcome summer visitor um, and sings a similar song uh, as the black-throated blue warbler. Um, both of these birds wintering in Central America and portions of the Caribbean. You can see uh, Cuba and Haiti and Jamaica. Um, so, Thinking of gradients and, and uh, the importance of multi-habitats, um, we spend, I spend a lot of time thinking about the breeding habitat because that's where I live and where I'm, I'm paid to do my day job. But um, we'd be, we, we ought to and are paying attention to, um, to the degree we can uh, to the, the quality and quantity of the, the wintering habitat. So this is climbing up the, up the gradient a little bit from the lake not to suggest that these are a, a mountain bird. Um, they are occurring at lower elevations around Rangeley, but in the forest. Uh, so a little up, up slope, so to speak, from the loon and the common merganser. The hermit thrush uh, occurring in the same forest with them. A partial migrant, not uh, going all the way to Central America, but uh, occurring throughout the New England states and uh, down into the Rocky Mountains and across Canadian provinces. Um, another, another bird as we walk up the mountain gradient, yellow-bellied sapsucker. This is a, a fun bird to listen for in the breeding season. They, um, they make quite a racket and I've often wondered how they've gotten away evolutionarily with uh, the young announcing loudly all afternoon long, all morning long where they are. But that's, um, that's a woodpecker nest that probably the most frequently found for me anyway, woodpecker nest because they they're sounding out. Now these birds have uh, are wrapping up their breeding activity. These birds being the warblers and the woodpeckers uh, uh, right now, and they have juveniles still on territory, but the territories are probably breaking down, and um, and uh, they're foraging in preparation for migration. This being a migratory woodpecker as opposed to the downy and hairy uh, blackback and affiliated, which are permanent residents. Again, here the summer breeding range. Um, Canadian provinces down the Appalachians, um, a little Maine, a little bit of New Hampshire and Vermont, and um, wintering across the southeastern U.S. and down the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. Blackburnian warbler, it, if you recall the black-throated green warbler, um, following the Appalachian spine using spruce and fir, usually incorporating a little bit of spruce and fir in its territory, and, um, and, and wintering in southern Central America and uh, across northern South America. All these warblers are, are much easier to find and hear by sound than by sight, though it's, it's well worthwhile on, uh, on bird walks to, to, uh, to, to try to track them down because their colors often are so brilliant. Um, and this male black-throated green, uh, black-burning warbler is an example of that. High-frequency singer, 
I am not sure. I know I lost um, at the age of 56, lost the ability to hear the Black Pole Warblers uh, song, a high frequency song. Um, and the Black Burnian Warbler, I can't say if I have or not. I, I didn't hear one this summer and I was in places I should have. So, um, so if you're, if you can still hear high frequencies, I encourage you to go out, learn them and listen to them and uh, while you still can. Uh, the blackback woodpecker and spruce grouse climbing up this mountain gradient. The uh, blackburnian warbler being one of those uh, a little higher up as you're picking up the softwoods on a on a walk up Mount Abraham or Saddleback. Spruce grouse and blackback woodpecker also occurring at higher elevations or higher latitudes, as you can see here in the accompanying range maps. And um, and then finally on up to sorry I skipped ahead. Um, the Bicknell's thrush may have heard of. It, um, it's breeding on, as I was mentioning, high summits. There's Mount Katahdin or Baxter, Park, Baxter Peak in Maine, um, the Adirondacks, uh, Cape Breton Island, and um, parts of Quebec and Labrador, breeding in spruce and fir, low scrubby spruce and fir subalpine, and uh, wintering in the Caribbean, um, a, a bird who is dependent upon fairly limited breeding and wintering grounds. And uh, during the bird festival, it's one of the birds that um, people, people are eager to seek out if they're trying to add to their life list. Uh, earlier, I was talking about, for me, the pleasures of birding and the fun of birding. And it's, um, it includes knowing this ecological context, why certain species such as the black, the, the, the Bicknells or the black pole warbler are occurring at, at the high mountain area. Um, they are, are it's, it's a, an ecological concept um, known as niche partitioning. Evolution has sorted out where, um, and I don't mean to imply some kind of cognitive sorting, uh, but as adaptive evolution works over multiple generations, uh, the, the environment is divided up, partitioned up, and, um, and various birds such as the thrush um, can be found occurring along this mountain gradient. Um, the Picknell's up top, Kermit and Veery down lower, and, um, and wood thrush as well. And at middle elevations, uh, oftentimes the Swainson's thrush. Um, so a similar taxonomic line that has uh, uh, diversified and radiated um, to use different environments, different forest types, all available with the Rangely, the Rangely area, the High Peaks area, um, and the Black Pole Warbler. Um, more closely related to a couple I showed you earlier, the black-throated green and black-throated blue warblers, and maybe a couple dozen species that are of warbler breeding in the area coming up from the, uh, the Caribbean and the Neotropics. And finally, an example of um, a, a very more common bird that you might see at your feeder lower down um, in Rangeley or, or, or uh, outside my window here in Damascata. Um, versus the higher elevation boreal chickadee. And um, I think there is some discussion afoot as to which one of these is indeed our state bird. Um, perhaps it's been resolved. Um, I know there are strong camps for, uh, for, for one or the other, and some people say, well, it's a chickadee, and that's close enough. But the boreal chickadee distinguished from, I'll do one funny quirky birder sound, um, um, and then uh, be letting you go in a moment or two. Uh, the, the boreal chickadee has a more nasal song. Um, so if the black cap chickadee has a staccato, clear chickadee, chickadee dee, the boreal chickadee is a nasal, nasally. Is that a word? Well, it is, it is here now. Um, chickadee, chickadee. So that I don't expect you to go out be able to go out and identify it by that poor representation, but to know that um, if, if you haven't done much birding by ear, there are a lot of subtleties and, um, and you, that you just can't capture in italicized words in a field guide. It's very helpful to have, um, well, I was going to say a CD that dates me, or cassette tape where I first learned them. Uh, very helpful to have a phone app that, um, that will identify the, the songs and calls for you and, um, and also the variation in the songs and calls. Um, back to the, the, the 
the bigger the bigger idea about um, or concept of of spatial prioritization when we're doing conservation and what is largely this is the, the um, a watershed boundary in the state of Maine, the Appalachian Trail nationally, and um, what this is depicting is uh, high integrity or low impact, low rates of human conversion um, uh, exists at the northern end of the Appalachian Trail. And that's this, the solid green is depicting that higher integrity. Um, but there's quite a bit of gap four, which is a term, a conservation status term that uh, references uh, the still fair, uh, still high proportions of, of private land in Maine. So we're doing conservation or trying to improve management, say along the Appalachian Trail corridor down in, in, the, uh, in the Smokies, the Southern Apps. Um, I find myself working and writing and commenting on the forest planning process, the USDA, US Forest Service planning process, or in the, in the midst of the Nantahala Pisgah review now. Um, and that's very ecologically rich lands, but um, in a lot of it in gap three management or multi-use US Forest Service management. And then throughout Virginia and, um, and New Hampshire, Vermont, and certainly much of Maine, it's still a private forested landscape. And that's the work um, among other, among other um, priorities that groups like the Maine Appalachian Trail Land Trust, Rangeley Lakes Heritage Trust, um, are working on conserving the the, uh, the landscape often through working forest easements or often through, and also through full ecological fee purchase. And finally, um, scale, scale, scale. Um, here, here are the big contiguous patches or low human impact with the Appalachian Trail as an anchor. Yeah, there's the high peaks region. And we zoom in a little more, um, start to pick up some of the features you recognize. And, and this is the high peaks region within the that northern forest um, that many different modeling schemes have picked out and identified as, as uh, nationally and globally important, including the important bird area program of National Audubon. And then finally, this is to demonstrate that um, though we might, uh, might predict model and identify values at, at um, according to landscape and biological uh, biological values and definitions and that they follow um, rougher gradients or, or um, have sloppier boundaries. Um, we're working within a private uh, property scheme oftentimes. And so these sharp geometric figures are represent actual conservation projects and parcels. This is a, a conservation easement called the Orbit and Stream or Link Letter Easement. And um, this is the Navy Sear base here and Crocker Mountain, um, a forest legacy project in conjunction with state and private philanthropy. And, um, and the Appalachian Trail here going through green, here's light green below Flagstaff, light green in this case being um, high ecological value, but, um, but still largely privately uh, owned and held. And so therefore the target of, um, or the subject of uh, conservation projects uh, in in play or or yet to be conceived, and uh, I'll conclude there. And I think I went a little over, which is not atypical for me, but um, still some time for questions. Uh, thank you, Pete. So uh, I don't see any questions in the chat box. I want to give people a few minutes uh, to uh, type any questions in you have there, and then uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll get Pete to respond. And while you do that, uh, I just want to say, first of all, thank you, Pete. Uh, it's great to see those maps of conserved lands and uh, think about how we can connect, you know, what, what are the lands we need to conserve in order to keep those corridors intact in perpetuity, way past our lifetimes. Uh, so that was great. Uh, if you're at all interested in birding, uh, which you would be if you're on this uh, <clears throat> webinar, uh, consider visiting our website, uh, Rangeley Lakes Heritage Trust. Uh, we have a birding trail, the Rangeley Region Birding Trail that we're adding to all the time. And uh, please, if you have a chance, if you're not already here, come up to Rangeley to the region and uh, get out on the land. You can refer to our website both for hiking and for the birding trail per se. 
Also, many of you may know, but some may not, that we uh, do an annual birding festival. Uh, we had to cancel this past year due to the COVID uh, epi pandemic, but uh, we did a virtual festival and we ended up having 400 people uh, register for that. It was a bit of a surprise. So we're anticipating a very uh, populous uh, festival next year. And we're also looking, we are about to do, to film a, a, a virtual cruise of uh, Umbagog Lake, the National Wildlife Refuge there during fall migration. We'll probably be filming mid-September and we'll have that on our website as well. So those are a few things that you may wanna come back to look at. Uh, so I'm getting a couple of questions here. So um, can you please repeat the names of the four land conservation areas around Rangeley Lake? Um, um, well, let me see here. There, um, it was probably in a slide um, that, uh, I think conservation areas. I'm drawing a. I'm drawing a blank. If the who, whomever's asking that could help me out, clarify a little more. There's um. um I was talking about Phillips. I was talking about Rangeley. Um, I don't know if David, you have some insight. Yeah. So right around Rangeley Lake, we the trust actually has some pro, uh, some properties. So we have South Bog Stream, which is uh, just to the west of uh, the Rangeley Lake State Park. Both all of those, that entire area is under conservation. We have the, on the west shore, we have Bald Mountain, which is uh, owned by the state of Maine, and it's under conservation. And on the north shore of the lake, uh, we have, uh, the trust has four or five discrete properties, all of which are signed. Uh, plus there's uh, Mingo Springs, which is a, a golf course, but uh, a piece of land that was donated by uh, the golf, or turned into a birding trail by the golf course and uh, we have an easement on that. So there's lots of lands right around the lake, no question. And the broader region, uh, you may have been thinking about uh, some of the other properties that Pete mentioned. So one very interesting area is the Parham Stream Valley and there's a tremendous little birding trail uh, owned by a friend of ours who uh, wants to have more and more people there. You can find that online pretty easily, Param uh, Birding Trail, Param Stream Birding Trail. So those are a few spots anyhow. Uh, Pete, here's another question. Uh, can you comment on logging issues versus conservation and birding? I sure can. I, um, I, I, I don't think of them as, um, as opposing necessarily. Um, the the reason we have such a big intact forest is is the land was, and in many cases still is being logged. Um, so I'm reporting to you live from a, I, I had a, uh, from the Wilderness Society, but I used to work for the Forest Society. And, and prior to that, I was a, a biologist with a small um, certified timber company. So in some cases, in many cases, uh, what we really need are big tracts of land and, um, and conservation dollars and funds are, are scarce. And, um, and so uh, a, a working forest easement, there are, there are different kinds and different qualities of working forest easement, is going to conserve um, more acreage. And in some cases, the, it's more acreage often of what we call matrix forest that are needed for viable populations for large scale conservation. Um, we also need, and I certainly am uh, working um, on behalf of it, more strict, more what you would strictly think of as conservation, full fee purchase, biodiversity being the, the primary or, or only objective. So um, um, it's, uh, it's there's there's that you're going to have you're going to have more wildlife in in uh or the potential for wildlife in a few decades um on on a forest that is harvested than um concrete and asphalt and that's not that's stating the obvious um and but you're not going to have all the wildlife um by any means and the viability certainly uh 
was up north of uh, Baxter State Park um, recently and the viability of populations on what from a distance looks forested turns out is pretty is harvested pretty hard so um, I think conservation can be done with both tools um, and they each play a part and that that's I'm that's not um, that's not a, a company line or a political or smooth way of it. I, I, I really believe in, in, in the current social economic system. Uh, I'm not just trying to walk a middle line in a current, this current social economic system, the one we got. Um, both are important means of doing conservation and important to bird life. Thanks, Pete. Uh, so we, we got a clarification to the first question about the area surrounding Range Lake. Uh, she's referring to the Wilderness Society slide. I'm not sure. That must be yeah. one of the ones. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not aware. The, the Wilderness Society doesn't own any property. Um, no, but I, you must have shown a slide that showed, oh. yeah, that had a map with uh, surrounding conservation areas around. Okay. Let's see. I'll go, uh, I'll, I'll tell you keep going. There must be a better way. It must be, where's, where's first slide? Well, oh. I'll, I'll end show and start again. Okay, maybe while you look through that, here's, here's another question. Um, what changes in forest practices would be most needed to create a diverse assemblage of native forest birds in Maine's Western mountains? I, I'd like to see a lot of forest um, grow older, um, more mature forest, ex more extensive mature yeah. forest. You know, age isn't always a correlate of size and structure, but um, roughly speaking, uh, an older forest has more vertical diversity and compositional diversity and yeah yeah that's pretty straightforward uh, is there a technical scientific balance of bird life versus forestry harvest you know any kind of metric or yeah, um, so uh, um, yeah formula or you know what's the balance is yeah no no hard no hard formula um, it's uh, we we oftentimes these uh, Forest management resource extraction are an ex are a large scale experiment, and I I am not laughing because it's funny. Um, it's a large scale experiment that uh, whose results come in too late. Um, something's been driven to the brink. Um, so there's there's no formula. It's monitoring and looking for signs of decline of a of a of a forest bird or a turtle or frog or 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 or, or flower yep. um and so it's an iterative empirical exercise yeah great so here's a comment from uh, sally stockwell at maine audubon one of our conservation leaders in the state along with you pete uh, the reason northern and western maine has been designated a globally significant iba important bird area is because there are so many different species and so many individuals of each species found in the area it is sometimes referred to as the baby bird factory for much of the Atlantic flyway and could considered essential to the future of many of these species. And despite the many treats these, threats these birds face, if they don't have good breeding habitat producing more baby birds, populations will continue to decline. It would be great to have at least 40 to 50 percent of the landscape in more mature forest conditions. So to your point, Pete. Yeah, and thank you. Thank you, Sally. I um. I hope I didn't. Uh, I hope I did. Did did your the, your, your modeling and and your organization and parent organizations modeling. Uh, well, maybe it's not parent, but anyway, some some measure of justice. <laughs> Thanks. So, um, Pete, I, I think so. Uh, back to the first question. So, rather than spend time looking for that particular slide right now, I think maybe uh, we. Uh, I can send I can send the slides to uh, Nancy Chandler, who's one asking these questions. Yeah, please. I'm and I'm sorry. I um, 
I'm, I'm too dull at this time of day in the week to, uh, to thumb right back. Yeah. So I think we will conclude. Let me make sure I get all these. Yep. I think we'll conclude the time. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Pete, so much for this and everything else you're doing with us and for us. Uh, we will make a recording of this available on the RLHT website. Uh, so feel free to, uh, come there and see it anytime. Again, please come up and join us. Thanks so much for joining us and uh, have a great evening. Hey, thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure. Thank you, David. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks.